Hello. Uh, my name is Jeff McCauley, and I wanted to welcome you to my Composition Online six-minute webinar uh, regarding 20th century compositional techniques. Uh, now, I'm going to do this in two parts. I'm going to do part one today, and then next Friday, I'm going to do part two, and we're going to continue on with uh, serialism and minimalism in music and the music after 1950. Now, uh, while we're in the 21st century now, well into the 21st century, um, it seems like, especially with this pandemic going on, um, uh, that I still believe the, the techniques that came out at the beginning of the 20th century, the origins of these techniques uh, and, and new radical uh, musical ideas of the 20th century are still being used and developed today. So I think it's a very important subject to speak about uh, regarding composition. Now, uh, we're gonna start off talking about Impressionism. Uh, and I say, uh, Impressionism was a movement in art that began during the second half of the 19th century and was followed by a movement in music with similar ideology. Um, now, if you think of paintings uh, of the uh, mid to late uh, 19th century, you say Monet or Manet, and these paintings seem blurry. If you're, if you're looking at them too closely, uh, they look very blurry. Um, not clear, uh, sloppy, if you will, um, but step back a few feet, a little distance, and the painting then transforms to something much more beautiful. And Impressionism is very much like this, that it's looking, I think Impressionism is looking at something through a different angle or looking at something through a different perspective. Now, this musical movement began with the music of the French composer Claude Debussy. And Debussy was very much looking at music and many aspects of music in a very different way, a different perspective, right? I say his style was an expansion of traditional tonal music with the use of extended thirds, chords built on fourths and fifths, and non-traditional scales such as the whole tone scale, uh, chromatic scales, pentatonic scales, and more, and other means used in an attempt to obscure tonality. Now, uh, even looking, you know, thinking about the whole tone scale, uh, what a way to obscure tonality, that we have a scale with no leading tones, no half steps, right? So when it goes up, it just sort of goes up into the floats off into space, or going down sort of just keeps ascending or descending into the ab abyss, let's say. Um, now, I say that he was obscuring tonality because Debussy was a tonal composer. He was, he was music was still rooted in Western uh, tonality, uh, major and minor tonality. However, he used these means that I just discussed in a way to obscure tonality. Um, I say Debussy used what composers of the time defined as dissonance as color, which gave him the ability to move from dissonant chord to chord without resolution. Um, there's a story that when Debussy, Debussy was a young man and he was in the conservatory in Paris, that uh, there were teachers that would hear him practicing in practice rooms and they would say that Debussy's a strange musician. He, he improvises dissonant chord to chord without resolution. And this was really because Debussy didn't need these chords to resolve. He didn't need the dissonance to resolve because he was thinking of dissonance in a different way. It was simply another color. So he was moving from colors rather than, than providing tension that needed to be resolved. I say his music helped open the door to the 20th century. Um, one more quick story about Debussy. Uh, there was a very famous, or I should say infamous, uh, musical production, uh, probably the most infamous musical production premiere of all time. In 1913 in Paris, uh, Stravinsky's The Rite of Spring premiered. Um, now, Stravinsky wrote the music, but it was uh, the choreography was done by another man named Vaslav Lijinsky. And together with the subject matter, um, and Nijinsky's choreography, both being very avant-garde and sort of pushing the boundaries or the limits of, of what art was doing at the time, um, that the music was also very experimental uh, with rhythm and meter and harmony. So all these aspects led to a very mixed reviews, let's say, of this premiere. And uh, some say there were riots at this premiere. Now, I know that the story I've heard that two French composers were, were in the audience, one by the name of Camille Saint-Saëns, who was a uh, much, a, much so, uh, more so a conservative, uh, ro late romantic composer. So he was still very much um, concerned with older forms and an older way of writing. 
Um, and his impression of this performance was that if this was the way music was going, he wanted nothing to do with it. Uh, whereas Debussy was in the audience as well, and he, he loved it and was very excited with, with this new uh, music that he was hearing and production, everything about it, as I said. So we'll see that Debussy was really a staple of somebody who opened the door to the 20th century, whereas Saint-Saëns, not so much. Uh, but that says nothing against his music either. I mean, you think Carnival of the Animals, uh, The Swan is probably one of the most, the prettiest pieces of music of all time, in my opinion. And I'm a little bit biased, I'm a cellist. But uh, next, uh, we'll talk about the music of the second Viennese school. Um, now, the first Viennese school consist consisted of the famous classical composers of the classic period, uh, Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven. And then we jump ahead 100 years or so, uh, we see the music of the second Viennese school, which I say Arnold Schoenberg and his students, Anton Webern and Albin Berg, Berg, were the composers who comprised what is now known as the second Viennese school. Now, Schoenberg's music, it, it, early Schoenberg, was much uh, still rooted in radical, uh, late romantic music. I think of his, his early music very much like Wagner and uh, even Mahler. Um, whereas then he started to experiment with tonality. I say this is the beginning of atonality in music and the 12-tone technique, 12-tone music, which led for the seeds uh, for serialism, which we'll get into next week. Um, now, atonal music, this was really uncharted territory. And while he started first writing atonal music, he developed 12-tone te technique in a way to organize the 12 tones of chromatic scale. And he did this because even if you're not in, a, in major or minor tonality, that once you stress one tone more than any other tone, then you're implying tonality. So uh, he, he found out a way to do this so he would organize the pitches so it would stay true to atonality, let's say. Now he was using something called a matrix for composition. It has nothing to do with the trilogy with Keanu Reeves, uh, but he had a very mathematical way in which he would organize these pitches. So he would start off with a 12 tone uh, row and then invert this and then play backwards and inversion, uh, the inversions backwards. So there was many multitudes uh, of ways that he would treat one row. And this was an attempt to, as I said, stay true to atonal music. I say in my classes, students will work on truly defining atonal music and compose a piece in 12 tone technique using a matrix of composition. So we will do that in classes that I'm giving online. Um, and next week, we're going to talk about serialism and minimalism. Now, I, I, th I really think Weber and especially, although we can talk about Berg as well and Sprechstimme and things, but uh, Webern's treatment of music and atonal music in, in particular led the way for serialism, which we'll get into and we'll talk about Milton Babbitt a bit. Um, and, but we'll also talk about minimalism. And I say it, this was a music, musical movement that was to fight against atone music and serialism. So this is quite interesting. Um, also neoclassicism, neoclassicism and quotation music. That's a tough word to say sometimes. We'll also speak about this a bit and look uh, at Stravinsky and Hindemith and Ives and, and Ellen Tafts Willich as well. So I hope you join me next week. Um, I wanna thank you so much for attending my six minute mini webinar. And for more information, please contact me at celloband at yahoo.com or visit my website, www.cellobandstudios.com. Thank you very much, and I hope to see you next week.